But uh, we hope everybody's okay and just maybe getting that extra hour of sleep. Actually, it wouldn't be extra. We lost one, didn't we? So. But it's good to see everybody here this morning. This morning, um, you may have noticed on the back of the bulletin, it says trust. It does say that, doesn't it? Okay. <laughs> I didn't look and check. But I trusted Debbie to put trust on there. <laughs> and, of course, she did. Trust is a very interesting thing, and as I, as I think about trust, as I, I've been thinking about it through the week and, and looking at it, I mean, there have been, there have been several things that, that I've encountered while trust has been on my mind, and things that have, have happened, and, and of course, you, it's sometimes those things are just happening all the time, and you're, you're not thinking about it, because you're not thinking about that particular subject. But when you think about trust and, and trying to, to figure out, okay, what's the difference between trust and faith? And, I mean, if you look them up as far as definition, uh, and then automatically probably somebody's phone's going to come up and you're going to Google definition of trust and definition of faith, you're going to find very much the same thing. I mean, it's, there's actually a little bit more on trust than there is on faith, if, at least the, the one that I, I pulled up and just did a, a quick search that way, um, that, that there's, there's no way you can really separate the two. There's a lot of passages that will use the word trust and some that will use the word faith. And, and even going back and, and looking at the root words and those kind of things, I mean, they are, they are tied together at the core as far as, as trusting someone or something and having faith in it and the similarity that is there with that. And in some cases, it doesn't necessarily have to do with, with honesty and whether you're trusting somebody, but maybe trusting in an ability. And that's some of the things you see more even in the word trust. It ties in the ability or the strength of another, not necessarily just the honesty of another. And of course, we find the same thing somewhat with faith, but you just don't see it as much within the definition. But one of the first things that, that hit me, and I mean just thinking about the word trust uh, and, and thinking about maybe who I trust or who I don't trust or, or some of those kind of things. Right away, this week, I mean, looking on at the first part of the week, we had, we had a service project that the youth were going to go and do and be involved in on Wednesday. And, and we were really looking forward to it. We'd had it planned for, for two or three weeks, and we were anxious for that to come. And... What was the forecast the first part of the week? It was going to rain. 100% chance of rain on Wednesday, right? Guess what? It didn't rain. But we had already canceled. Now, as it worked out, it was wonderful that we trusted the weatherman in that. I hope nobody's related to a weatherman in here. I'm not trying to down talk the weatherman. They, I know they do the best job that they can do. They've got a, a, a hard job. But it's a good thing we trust him because it gave us the opportunity to set up the youth garage sale and set everything inside and, and have everything set up. And you know, it actually did rain some then on, on Friday, you know, in the afternoon. There was, I think, and then Saturday there was some rain. And so that, that we had it inside was great. It gave us the opportunity to work at that through the day. And uh, guys, you ought to be proud of our teens. I mean, they did a wonderful job setting everything up and, and getting everything out there. And, and it was really good. But I trusted the weatherman. And he let me down. <laughs> he really did. He let me down. And... You know, it wasn't anything, and it's, it's interesting because in general, how many of you trust the weathermen as far as the forecast? You trust the forecast? <laughs> not very many hands, a few hands went up, not very many hands went up. Because there are so many instances where you, you will plan around what the forecast is, and, and it just doesn't work out that way. And, and so, don't you love being able to go on and look at the weather map yourself? How many do that? You, you go and you look at the radar, and you look at it yourself. Why? You trust your own instincts better on where that rain's at. You know, I look, and if there's no rain coming, well, it's not going to rain. Well, I know that's not always true, right? Because that, that, whichever it is, the, the warm air comes up, meets the cool, moist air coming down, or vice versa, and, and when those hit together, all of a sudden, boom, there's rain right there. And it wasn't there before. So you can't always trust that. Who are you going to trust these days? I mean, we're, we're in the middle of, of an election year, right? How many of y'all thought of that when I said, who are you going to trust these days? Okay. <laughs> a 
know, being honest with that. You know, who are you going to trust? Who are you going to believe? Can you even trust yourself at times? And even your own response to things. I mean, trust is an extremely important thing. And with it comes a great deal of responsibility. Somebody just fairly recent, that I love very much, said to me, I trust you. And it was just, I don't know if it was the timing of those words or all the extenuating circumstances surrounding it. But all of a sudden, it weighed really heavy. Somebody places their trust in you. You don't want to let them down, do you? You don't want to break that in any way. Trust. There's some passages of scriptures I want us to go to. Turn over to Proverbs. And a lot of you will be very familiar with this. In Proverbs chapter 3. Verse 5, he says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him, and he will make your, straight, your paths straight. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. With all your heart. How much do you trust God? I mean, isn't it reflected in how we act, how much we obey, trust and obey? I mean, when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way, our paths. And to do his good will. I mean, are we, are we trusting him? Or are we leaning on our own understanding? I mean, this, this, this proverb puts those at odds with one another. <laughs> Trusting in the Lord with all your heart or leaning on your own understanding. Which one? It is so easy to lean on our own understanding, isn't it? I mean, how many of us admitted that's what we do with the weather map, a <laughs> radar? <laughs> you know? We look at the radar because we can figure it out better than the weatherman can figure it out. No, we can't. We get lucky sometimes. But, it is so easy to lean on our own understanding, what we know, what we've seen to be true. I mean, God tells us, there are so many applications to this. God tells us to, the proverbial phrase, turn the other cheek. Turn the other cheek? Somebody, somebody slaps you and you turn the other cheek? Somebody takes you. I mean, we, so many of us maybe have been, been around and we've, we've heard the stories and we've, we've heard the things of, of the Roman government and, and what the soldiers could demand of people and, and demanding their, their outer cloak, demanding that they carry their gear for them. I mean, those things. And, and Jesus, Jesus takes it a step further. And he says, if, if they want your, want your coat, give them your shirt too. I mean, these kind of things. But how many of us lean on our own understanding when, when the rubber meets the road with this? Somebody takes you. They have, they have wronged you. They take something from you. How many of us giving, give them something more? Or how many of us lean on our own, own understanding knowing they're going to take that too and we're going to get nothing in return for that? Not going to do any good. Did you ever think that? Leaning on our own understanding is different than trusting God. Leaning on the things that we have learned in life. That if you turn the other cheek, you're going to get hit again. Right? That's what we learn in our own understanding. It's not about whether we get hit again or not. 
It's about the, what the world sees in us. And it may not even be about the person that might be hitting us on the other cheek. It might be, but it might not be about them. But that we extend from us a trust in God that, that when he's given us instruction, that we follow it. Trust and obey. Because there's so many things we're not going to obey if we don't trust. So we have to trust that he's telling us the right way. Sometimes we place our trust in the wrong place in Psalm 118. And it, it goes along with just exactly what we've just been talking about. Psalm 118. It says in verse 8, It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in humans. It is better to take refuge, a place to hide out, a place to be safe. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in humans. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. Okay, so it's election year. We shouldn't be putting our trust in princes anyway. It's better to have refuge in the Lord than to put your trust in human beings. It's better to have your refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes by princes talking about those who rule. I mean, there are other psalms that talk about that, other places. Psalm 146 uh, is another one that, that says pretty much the same thing. Psalm 146 and verse 3. Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings, who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. I mean, we can make all the plans in the world. We can, we can um, have everything lined out the way it's going to be. And he's talking even about rulers of the world here. That if we put our trust in, in all of the things that we are bombarded with, especially right now, and all the plans... When those people take their last breath and they're gone, somebody else is going to have different plans in their place. That's what he's saying is, we have one that we can put our trust in that is for eternity, not just, not just the here and now. And so there are much more important things than everything that's even going on this year. Is it important? Sure, it's important. Does God place governments in place? Sure he does. We've got Romans 13 and we have instruction on that more so than anything else that we submit and that we recognize that God has authority in place for a reason. I mean, all of those things. But when we're, when we're looking at the idea of trust, let's not put our trust in that. Let's put our trust in God. Our refuge is in Him. He is our protector. He is our eternity. Not something that's going to pass away. Not something that's, that's going to be a plan that's going to either fail or succeed for a time until another one comes and then some other plan is going to be in place. Why do people not trust God? Why do people not trust other people? How many like to, when you first get to know somebody, extend grace and trust them because they've given you no reason not to? How many like to do that? Quite a few. Some people, maybe because you've been burned a lot, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands on this one, you can raise them if you want, you don't trust anybody until they give you a reason to trust them. Sometimes that's where we come from. But it's good to be able to give grace and to trust somebody until they give you a reason not to trust them. And sometimes that doesn't take very long. But when they lie to you, or when they cheat you, or when they, you, you, you find that they are untrustworthy, do you stop trusting them? Yeah. 
That's, that's a given, right? We stop trusting them. And so we're, we're very cautious about what we would leave in their care. And if a mechanic um, says that he's going to call you before he does anything to your car, he's going to call you first and, and let you know, okay, this is what's wrong, and, and you decide whether you want to spend that money and fix it or not. And he, you haven't heard from him for a couple of days. You give him a call, and, and he says, oh, well, I've replaced this, and I've replaced this, and I've replaced that, and here's what it is so far, but I'm still looking for another problem that's going on. That, how do you feel about that guy? You trust him? No. Are you going to take your car back to him again, probably? No. It's because we have a reason not to trust. And that's the reason God is telling us, don't put your trust in human beings. And that isn't, but he's, that's, that's across the board. You know, trust goes in God. It doesn't mean we can't trust each other. But I mean, we also realize, I mean, if we all sin and fall short of the glory of God, and we do, Scripture tells us that we do, Romans 3 and 23. So if, if that happens, then, then there are going to be occasions when you're going to give me a reason maybe not to trust you, or I'm going to give you a reason not to trust me. Is that true? I'm going to fail at something. I'm going to sin. You're going to fail at something. You're going to sin. It doesn't mean that all trust has to be broken, but we understand this concept of why we don't trust people. But why don't people trust God? I'm going to say something, and at first you're going to go, whoa. <laughs> because even just saying it, I really don't want to say it this way, for the same reason. But it isn't because God has let people down, it's because we have expectations of God that he's never promised. Turn to Psalm 22. How many of you know what Psalm 22 is about? Psalm 22, Jesus quoted it on the cross. It has other things besides what Jesus quoted on the cross within it that indicates that it is a messianic psalm. It's, it's prophetic of what was going to happen to Jesus. And so I want to I read this. And, you know, it's only 31 verses. Does anybody mind if I read all of that? Let's read this together, just so we get the context. I, I want you to see, this is, this is an amazing... We got one back here? <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> Thank you, David. I appreciate it. Let's read Psalm 22, because I, I've really just got one, one point in this, but nobody raised their hand when I said, does anybody know what this psalm is about? And this, this psalm is so important. I mean, I think Jesus, when he quoted the first part of this, he wasn't just saying some words and crying from his heart. He was, but he was saying some words that the rest of these people would have recognized and this psalm would have come to their mind. He's hanging on the cross, and all of a sudden, the rest of these words, I mean, we remember words to songs, don't we? When we walk with the Lord in the what? Everybody remember that. These people would, when Jesus says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? They would have been able to say the next line. Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my cries of anguish. My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. You are enthroned, yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people, all who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. 
He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast on you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me. Strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Roaring lions that tear their prey open, their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is turned to wax, it is melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me, a pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. But you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lion. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to dust will kneel before him, those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. And the psalm speaks for itself, doesn't it? When you place it in the context of Jesus beginning the quote. But what were the people doing? What were they saying about Jesus hanging on the cross? If he's the Son of God, let him come down from the cross. He trusts in God, let God deliver him. And this psalm is quoting it. I mean, quoting these people... So many years before they did it. So Jesus says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus was becoming sin for all of us. How could a father bear that? But he did. He couldn't have that fellowship with that sin on him. He has no fellowship with darkness. But these people were saying he trusted in God. Let him deliver him. You hear the expectation? The expectation of God? And even, I mean, they're they're mocking him in this. They're staring at him. He says, I'm open for the world to see. My bones are out of joint. They pierce my hands and my feet. I'm hanging here. My tongue is clinging to the roof of my mouth. I'm dry. I'm dying. And the people are are talking about trust in God. Expectations that for that circumstance was completely unrealistic because he had to die. That the nations, even those who were unborn yet then, us today, will say, he has done it. This was even talking about us. 
He has done it. I mean, the very reason to trust in him was the fact that he left Jesus on that cross to die. Because he said that he would. But sometimes we have expectations of God, even as these people may have had expectations of God. They had expectations of what the Messiah was going to be. They were thinking, okay, Jesus, if this man truly trusts in God, then God's going to bring him down from the cross. On their part, an unrealistic expectation. I mean, for maybe some circumstances, he delivered people from lions. He delivered people from a fiery furnace. Why not deliver this man from the cross? If he's, if he's really God's son, if he really trusts in God, then he'll be able to come down from there. Can you see how they would have thought that? This is Jesus. They had seen the things that he could do. This is Jesus. This is the mob that wasn't a mob, but rather a, a, a praising choir as they were singing as he was coming into Jerusalem and throwing palm branches down and he was riding on a donkey. It wasn't as, as if they didn't know the things that he had done. It's so easy to be hard on them, but their expectations from their point of view, even, even in their mocking, they're still saying something. They're revealing some kind of expectation. Let him come down. That's who he is. If we would be as hard on ourselves as we are on them. Sometimes people develop expectations of God. Sometimes people make deals with God or they attempt to make deals with, well, I, God, I'm going to do this. I just need this from you. If you will do this for me, I won't do this anymore. I'll make it right. I remember, I don't even know what the movie was. Burt Reynolds was in it. He was way out in the waters. Anybody remember this? And he was swimming towards shore, but he was, it was way too far to go. And, and he was telling God how he was going to give him, he was, he was going to give him his life. That was it. If he'd just get him to shore. The closer he got to shore, the less of his life continued to, to be given to God. And we do that kind of thing. Expectations. But when we have an expectation of God, and it is not His will for us, and that lets us down, then we develop this distrust for God. So there's a lot of people in the world who don't really know God there's never really been the, the, the attempt to learn who God is through his word, through even the associations with others who have a relationship with God. But, the, but develop an expectation from God and because that expectation isn't met. met. And sometimes this is fueled. I mean, there, you, can, you can turn on the radio, you can turn on the TV, you can go various places, and you can hear, if you will just open up and give to God, you will have so much in return in abundance in cash, and, and you're going to get all of this. Does God promise us that? I mean, where do we find that in His Word? In return of giving our lives to Him. I mean, he's, he's already given to us in abundance. He has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus from Ephesians chapter 1. But we can develop these expectations of God and when they don't happen, all of a sudden we don't trust God as though it was God that let us down. And so yes, it's the same reason we don't trust people because we were let down. But in this case, it's because of us, not because of him. And in some cases, it may even be that way with people. We may have expectations that are unrealistic. 
And so it could, that could go both ways. I have some more passages of Scripture, a lot of them having to do with, with faith and God's faithfulness. But we took some extra time and we read in Psalm 22, and I'm glad we did. Because it, I mean, all the passages that deal with the faithfulness of God, and whether, whether or not we even remain faithful, He does remain faithful. That's who He is. And when we recognize what he did in Christ, what he did on that cross, I mean, there's nothing that could back up, there's nothing that could stand as a proclamation more so to the faithfulness and the trustworthiness of our Father and God than that. That he did that with his Son and he did it for us. So there's only one other passage I'd like to read, and the praise team wants to come on up, you guys can. Before I read this one, there was a quote, and I probably don't have it word for word, from Charles Spurgeon, who said, if you're going to believe, believe to the hilt. If you're going to believe, and this is the word of God, then you believe every letter of it or don't believe it at all. Because otherwise it will become useless to you. In Romans chapter 15, this last passage I want to read together with you. 